So the readings today are from Exodus 10 and 11, and both of these chapters are really the last, the tail end of all of the plagues that God brought upon uh, Pharaoh in Egypt as Moses was uh, speaking to Pharaoh about <clears throat> letting his people go, saying, the Lord is saying um, to let my people go. And as we know, Pharaoh continued to refuse. So chapter 10 goes through the eighth plague of the locusts, the ninth plague of darkness, and then, of course, that last and final threat, which was uh, the death of all of the firstborn, which would have included Pharaoh's own son. So I'm going to read to you a little bit up from chapter 11. The Lord said to Moses, Yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for the silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the, of the people. I love that, that they had that, that respect of Moses. So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. I never saw this before, that this was beyond the people. This was firstborn of every creature. Such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. There shall be a great cry throughout all of the land of Egypt, such as there never has been, nor ever will be again. Now, this story of Moses and the ten plagues of Egypt, um, pretty awesome situation here. Moses is approached by God in the wilderness in this burning bush. And I can't help but make note of this. I was As I was reading through this passage of scripture, I just laughed at Moses, who is basically arguing with God. And it's funny because we do the same thing, but... I think to myself, would I have been different had I seen this this burning bush, this this figure of of Christ or you know of God right in front of me? And how could I still be arguing? But I'm guessing I probably would be. The reality is here that God equips him. He um, he kind of bargains with Moses in this situation. He gives him Aaron. He basically was like, okay, enough, enough. Of, of course, I'll let you have Aaron. He can speak for you because you feel so like you're not, un, you know, you're not confident here. But how many times is it that God approaches us and we feel unable to do something? And yet if we just trust and obey him, he is faithful to getting us through just as he showed in this example of Moses. Now, one of the things that we see repeated in this passage of scripture over and over again is that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And this is really puzzling to me because it seems as though, you know, God is causing Pharaoh to have this more evil in him. And I don't think that that's true. What I do believe, however, is that God allowed Pharaoh to act on his own part. And in a way, um, this brings glory to God in the end because had Pharaoh just given up after the first plague, it would not have been to God's glory. It would have just been him saying, okay, get out of here. But this was something that God was able to really show himself through Moses and through these plagues uh, to show his power and to show his might and ultimately free his people. So before we get started on tonight's lesson, I wanted to go ahead and share with you a brush that I'll be using. This is a water brush. Many of you uh, may have seen these before. There's all sorts of different brands. I'm a particular uh, big fan of this particular one here. This is by Tim Holtz, but this is a Ranger product. So this is the packaging that it came with. And typically you can find these in your mixed media sections of the art, arts and crafts um, area, the mixed media, usually with stamps and inks. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of what else, maybe where your gelatos are. So typically that's where you're going to find these guys. Um, this one here is a little bit more complex. Some of them are not so difficult, but if you unscrew this section, you'll see this little black stopper. And this one does have some water in it. So let me just go ahead and use some force to remove that stopper. So you'll have this little black piece 
that I've dropped on the floor. Here it is. So you'll have this little black piece and you'll see that there's a hole in there and that's just going to kind of act as a filtering system here for my um, water, not to clean it, filter it, but to filter into a small section. So inside here, there's gonna be almost a little straw. And when I am able, when I press to squeeze the water out, it's gonna make sure that there's only small amounts of water being released to the tip of the brush. So once it's all screwed tight, and of course this has been filled with water, then I'll be able to um, open the lid and you can actually see some of the water coming down into here and that's gonna release it then for me to be able to, to paint with. And if you don't have one of these brushes, of course you can always go to your um, old fashioned cup of water with a regular brush and use paints uh, however it is comfortable for you. All right, so here we are with all of our plagues. We have, I have them all numbered out here with some small sketches. And this particular page was photocopied for you so that you could use this exact template if you wish. But this is simply a page that, um, you know, I started with the numbers. So if you remember our lesson a few weeks back, um, we talked a little bit about block numbers and how you can write out the number and trace around or write out the letter and trace around and get these hollow spaces. And we love hollow spaces because of the fact that we can then color it in using either um, textures or um, patterns. It'd even be fun. I mean, it would be take a little bit of time, but it would be really fun to do with washi tape. I'm kind of actually considering that as a finishing touch here. But what I wanted to really work with tonight in our materials, um, which is why I wanted to get this pre-drawn since there's so much going on, I wanted to talk a little bit about materials that are water-based. So we talked a little bit about this paintbrush. We're going to use this as our um, kind of our trusty tool here, but I'm going to show you some of the other materials that I'll be experimenting with and that way when you see the speed up you can kind of see me using a variety of materials um, according to whatever you know color I might want or technique I want to use depending on the size or or what I'm doing. So let's talk first. The first thing I wanted to share with you are these really great pens by King Art and uh, these are very much like a lot of pens that you can find on the market Nothing in particularly great about these. I just really like the quality and the small uh, point and they are permanent. This is a 0.2 and a 0.3. So that's kind of the sizing of what I did for the sketches here. Also, I always recommend getting yourself a white eraser like this. These are poly erasers. If you don't have one, this is going to be a real life changer for you and just a few cents of a difference. And I like this because it's just a really clean um, it doesn't smear very easily and it just takes away all those marks with almost no, um, with no spaces or any smudging left behind. Okay, so as far as our watercolor materials go, I'm doing everything but paint. So you will not see me using any sort of paint, whether dried or um, fluid paint tonight. Instead, I'm thinking about other types of water-based materials. So I'm starting here with two different kinds of watercolor pencils. These are a little, these are a little rough here, but I've got some colored pencils by Stampin' Up, which just happened to be a set that I had um, inherited from someone back in the day. And then I also have my trusty set from Faber-Castell. And I like these for a couple of reasons. Number one, I can always tell them apart from my regular pencils because they are triangular and they're also, the, they have these gray bumps on here. So I particularly love these as well. Um, watercolor pencils. So the beauty with these, and let me go ahead and just find a section. Um, looks like these might be broken on me a little bit. Maybe they've melted. But I'll just go ahead and kind of color in some of the frog. So you're going to get the same kind of color quality that you would with any colored pencil. But the beauty is that you can kind of add in sections and not have to worry about being so perfect with your coloring because once you go back in um, with your paintbrush and your water, you can kind of spread these things out and you fill in all of the spaces um, that you weren't particularly so careful with as far as coloring goes. It also gives you a little bit more of a painterly effect without having to go uh, too hardcore with your painting. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use a little bit of water. There's already quite a bit of water flowing from here. You can't, won't be able to see that I'm sure on the camera, but I'm just gonna be able to move this paint around and I can blend it in and get rid of some of those bubbles. Now, of course, there can be, um, I'm working in a really tiny, tiny little space here. So um, just imagine being able to take some of this color and do these washes in the background. But again, um, 
this is one way of doing uh, your coloring is with these watercolor pencils. All right, another thing that I've got out here are gelatos. Um, gelatos are a paint stick, but they are water-based. They look a little bit like a chapstick. These particular, uh, this particular brand called Gelatos are from uh, Faber-Castell. And there is a sister kind of product to these from Ranger. And these are going to be called Distressed Crayons. Now there is also a, a third product that I highly recommend and they are um, Dina Winkley's let me see if I have them here. Yes, I have some scribble sticks. So scribble sticks are very much the same. Um, they come in a tin like this. Some nice bright colors, a couple different versions of these palettes. But all of these three products are really the same thing in that they are, um, you're able to use water to spread them around, but they're going to also be able to be used dry, especially um, they work great with sponges or stencils. And so you can see that what I'm really doing is just holding the stick in my hand, getting it wet with my little paintbrush here, and then I can go ahead and apply as if I'm painting, but with a lot less mess. And especially when I am on the go, these two products right here are really great because they're easy to hold, one in one hand, one in the other, but there's no mess. There's virtually no mess at all. So this is really fun as well to be able to kind of just add in. And if I want to change the tone here, I can go a little uh, deeper tone of blue. It's going to squeeze really gently with um, pressure on my brush to get some water flowing and then I can come back in here and start to blend these colors out together. So again, great watercolor effect, um, easy to use. Of course, I could use these kind of in the background in bigger spaces, um, kind of scribbling them on and then going over it. But when you do that, do be prepared to have some streaks kind of staying put. So it is important if you want that painterly style to kind of use it. Um, use it this way where you're kind of in a little more control of where things are going. All right. Distressed crayons and the scribble sticks would all work exactly the same as those gelatos as I just showed you. So the next product I want to think about here or the next, I shouldn't say necessarily product because it's not really about the product. It's more about the material itself, the medium, um, all these water-based me mediums. So I have invested in this little board and it's considered a watercolor palette and I know that might sound strange because you're like okay where is the watercolor well typically watercolor tins have sides on them and artists would squirt out small amounts of the little watercolors that come in the tubes and you could do that with this as well kind of leaving uh, little piles of the of the wet paint to dry over a period of time those are never really used a lot of people don't know this but the paints that come into the tubes are not meant to be used wet. They're actually meant to be able to put on a palette like this or one of the tins and to leave it to dry just like you would find in the cakes. That's why a lot of times it doesn't matter whether you buy a high quality cake or um, sometimes people will think that if they're buying the paint in the tubes that they're getting a higher quality. It really just depends more on the brand, not so much the dryness or um, having it come in the tube. But this palette is particularly handy for using all of these materials, really, besides the colored pencils, but the sticks for sure, the paint sticks, but also these guys. So these are Tombow pens along with some Artist Loft uh, kind of mimic Tombow pens, but these are water-based markers. And really, you could even use your basic Crayola markers for the same thing. So what I can do here is actually color. And if you notice how it kind of pools up, it doesn't, um, I'm not really giving it a chance to soak in, it's just going to leave the paint there for me to then smear around. So the cool thing about this is that I can use colors that maybe I don't have in gel in a gelato. I can also kind of blend colors and make new colors right here on my palette. And then I can go ahead and bring them back into um, wherever it is that I'm painting and do some altering of those um altering of those colors, but it's all being mixed right here. And the greatest thing about this, all it's gonna take is a little baby wipe. So just grab your wipes out and you can wipe this right off the page and you've got a completely clean palette and you're able to rework with some more colors. So really you could have a lot of fun with this in the sense of just kind of leaving yourself some piles of color. Um, and I think honestly, guys, I mean, I spent only a few bucks on this anyway. But really, this is just like a piece of plexi would work perfectly for this. It's nice having this white one just so you can kind of see. But this is great for mixing colors and just kind of using um, the palettes that you have with the materials that you have on hand. 
So I'll go ahead and get back to this guy over here and just go ahead and add in. You can see how nicely those colors, they're going to be so vivid and bright. And instead of having that kind of um, a, that heavy ink by just hitting, you know, going in here and painting this, it gives you the chance to kind of use it as the tone, but mixing it with water. And so it has a little lesser effect um, and not being so overbearing on these thin Bible pages. Now, of course, you can use those Tumble pens directly, but I know for myself, I have had trouble with bleed through with the pens, which is because it's got such a heavy pigment of ink. So this is an alternative to being able to get those same bright colors, the same arrangement of colors, but in a new way and kind of water them down. So hopefully some of these tricks have been interesting for you as to consider, depending on what you have at hand or what you're kind of looking at as far as expanding. I think a lot of this is great for on, on the road and travel uh, because you can kind of get this painterly style in what you're journaling without having the mess of taking everything with you. a finishing touch to my page and I'm kind of working all over the place here tonight as part of the video is kind of a risky thing that some of you may not be comfortable doing and I totally understand why. <laughs> so I am actually applying washi tape and I was really obsessed with this idea because I had so many prints that um, worked with whatever the pictures were that I did. So I wanted to use this washi tape. So what I'm doing is I'm actually laying the washi tape over my numbers um, in most cases, I can see through them. Now, this could definitely be done ahead of time, which I think would be much, much smarter to actually, um, you know, you could lay out your washi tape onto, let's say, a piece of paper and then draw over them and cut them out as stickers. Some of you have really cool machines that do this as well, where you can create your own stickers. Um, I think this would be super cool. But what I have done here, and this is like the worst case scenario, is I've laid over the washi tape. And then I am very, very carefully um, cutting just the surface of the tape. And because our Bible pages are so thin, I'm not gonna lie to you, I have cut through the paper a couple of times but then I just reinforce the back if I do go through. But most of the time, what I'm able to do is trim just enough to then pull the washi tape up where it's been uh, just basically scored. And then I can create um, these really cool numbers. And the, the cool thing is just, I hardly ever use washi tape. I don't know why, but I just feel like I don't use it as much as I want to use it because I love the patterns. So for this particular um, work I thought this was going to be really cool to see each of the numbers kind of have their own each of the plagues have their own pattern print.